up. This is a, uh, for kind of a discussion night. Uh, there's some things that, we, you know, we've been talking about, things that are kind of moving us forward um, in uh, talking about and looking at faith and what faith is and how it affects us and how we, you know, we build up our faith and what it is, uh, you know, as, as far as personally, understanding what the definition of it was or is and how that relates to us and pushes us to make certain decisions. Um, first, how, yeah, what, what's, a, what's a good definition of faith? We've been talking about that. I want to just know that you and me and all of us are kind of on the same page with understanding what faith is from a biblical perspective. Okay, to believe. Strong conviction. That's the, that's the proper translation of that word in the original Greek is you know to a strong conviction or a persuasion and to and of course to have that strong conviction uh, there are things that we need to do I mean a strong conviction in and of itself just you know is it's really a shallow you know it, it means nothing I mean it's all in vain it's all for naught to say you know I'm persuaded by something but I'm not going to act on it or I'm not going to do anything with it and so uh, faith you know and we look started looking Sunday night. Um, this past week, uh, the Sunday night sermon with, uh, you know, how faith cannot just be in and of itself. When you look at it, the way that faith operates in the New Testament, and even in the Old Testament, there, you know, it can't stand alone. There are things that kind of go to, with it to validate it, to make it, you know, to make faith what it is with faith. Last week, we started looking at Hebrews chapter 11 and started looking at what, um, you know, what enabled all of these different Old Testament figures to have the faith that they needed. I mean, if you were to ask, you know, does, does Abel, I mean, did Abel have faith? Okay, how do we know that? Okay, he gave a better sacrifice. And who told him about that sacrifice? God. I mean, he, you know, we know that he knew that God gave that to him. And so, of what faith is. I mean, you know, someone with a faith-only mindset that believes you do not need to be baptized in order to have salvation and say, all you have to do is have faith or all you have to do is say this prayer or, you know, whatever the case might be. Um, you know, how do you prove that you have faith if you believe in a faith-only setting? Have you ever thought about that? Ask someone, you know, how do you, know, do you have faith and with a faith, you know, and, and if they believe, well, I don't have to do anything, well, prove it then. I mean, how do you prove it? How can you show, you know, because James says, I'll show you my faith what? By my works. That's how you're going to show faith. And the moment that someone with a faith-only mindset starts to say anything of what they do, of how to show faith, they've immediately given up their faith-only their faith-only doctrine. Because faith only does cannot operate in and of itself. How do you know if I was to try to convince you, how do I know that I have faith? How do you know that I have faith if I don't have anything connected to it? It's impossible, isn't it? They can say, Well, I just know, I just have this feeling, but that's really as far as it gets, and that is not you know, you know there's nothing biblical about, well, I just have this feeling or an emotion. Right. Now, they'll say sometimes, like, okay, well, now I have faith, I've been baptized, now I'm expected to start obeying, but that still negates the fact that, how do I know that I have faith, or how do you know that I have faith, or how do I know that you have faith? Right. That is a big part of it, isn't it? Um, you know, and that's where, <laughs> you know, when you bring repentance into it, do you think repentance is not a work in and of itself? I mean, you think, how many in here have repented of something? How many in here have repented of something that was really, really hard in your life to repent? To just say, I, you know, I'm going to give this up, I'm going to turn a different direction, and I know how difficult this is, but I know what's necessary in order to do this. That is a huge step, isn't it? That's a work in and of itself, is repentance. In fact, repentance is probably, when you're talking about the road to salvation, how much easier is it to get baptized than to repent of something that you might be all caught up in that you know you need to give up? 
There's not even a comparison, is it? Baptism's easy. But repenting of something, if I know, hey, I need to change, I know I'm doing something that I should not be doing, and I need to, you know, I need to make that, I need to change that course, that is a much more difficult thing to do than baptism ever was. And so that is a, and you think that had to be done. And then baptism, for some reason, baptism is just the, I don't know, it's a thorn in their side. They think, well, we can't work our way to hell. Well, you know what? Repentance is a, you know, is a work. You're giving stuff, something up and saying, I'm going to replace it by following what God says. That is in and of itself an act or a work. And so we're thinking, you know, we're talking about these things with what, you know, what builds our faith and what enables us to have the strong faith that we do. I want to, I want to kind of change a direction a little bit, not change directions, but just kind of in keeping that same vein, kind of go in a different path tonight. And this is where I really want to, you know, is hopefully we can get into some good discussion here. So we know that, you know, what we have to do to build up our faith, right? I mean, we just, you know, there are things that we probably have in our mind, there are things that we've just been told, things that we've probably practiced or we've seen our parents do or things that we've taught, been taught. Some of them might be routine, some of them might not be. What can cause, though, what can cause our faith to weaken? So I want to get a list going right here. How many in here, we don't, we don't need to know details, but I think all of us have probably been there. How many in here have had your faith weakened or challenged at some point in your life where you just feel I'm not as strong as I need to be or I'm not doing what I need to be doing again we don't need details with it but all of us I think have gone through some point in our life where we just think I you know my you know I don't know if I have a strong enough faith of what I need what are some of those things you don't need to use your personal you know experiences per se but what what are some things that can cause us to for our faith to weaken or even be completely broken. Relationships. Okay. And what? Why a relationship? I mean, how how would that kind of weaken the faith? Well, you know, you want to be very sure. Okay. Okay, so you're talking about the friction that can be caused in it, or? That and just the control, right? Okay. Okay, so you're trying to appease your your yeah. spouse or your partner or you know yeah. whoever you're with. Yeah. Instead of and both, you know, okay, fine, I just want to do it. Okay, so they they start to take they start to take the lead instead of God taking the lead, or they yeah. start to be you know take the place of right. God. Okay, relationships are a big one. We you know, and I've known several people that have uh, the, the the same thing. Their you know their faith is really tested. Uh, through a relationship, and especially so, and it gets really difficult, doesn't it, when that spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend just flat out doesn't even want to go, or, or what, and then all of a sudden, what if they want to stop you from going and say, I don't want you to, you know, I don't want you to attend anymore, and it gets even deeper when they have children involved, and they don't want you to take that child, or they don't want to get the child involved with it, and, you know, and that can really start to build and there can be resentment, or if there's not, you know, the only way that someone can feel that I've got to, you know, the only way to take care of this resentment is I've got to get up, I've got to give up my church life and not going. So that that's probably a very strong. I went to Bible study, and I literally could not do it at my home. Like she wouldn't be in there when she goes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, that's, I mean, it's tough. I mean, when you're, you know, when you have someone that is, you know, going against it, um, you know, sometimes it's not always like that. Sometimes, you know, they're, you have a spouse that's just more than willing to let you do, you know, do whatever it makes you feel good. Uh, if that's, you know, if that's what you want, they're, you know, they're fine and they're supportive. 
and that's okay, but relationships are you know, definitely one that can weaken. Daria, you had your hand up. Um, not opening God's word. Okay. I'm going to put not studying the Bible. Okay, how, I mean, give me an example, or kind of expand on that. I mean, we probably know where, you know, we can all have our own ideas, but, you know, that, well, well we just don't. God's going to, to reveal your sins to take away your sins. Okay. So staying away from that, you know, and just stay away from it. Gets easier and easier, doesn't it? Ashley, do you have something with it? Okay, so not study your Bible, not praying. I want to hit on these two as well, and, and praying probably goes along with this as well. I mean, you know, if you, you know, if you study the, you know, if you study daily, how many in here study every day? How many open their Bibles every day? Honestly, I mean, that's, you know, I'm not going to, we're not judging anyone if you don't. Um, how many open it? Probably, you know, a couple times a week. Okay. All of us probably, you know, at least a couple times a week. I do it every single day because it's my job, but much easier for me because I have the time. I mean, that's where I'm focused is with the time. Not everyone has that. And some, you know, they just, they work out long hours or they, you know, they're preoccupied with uh, taking care of families or something else. And we don't always have the Bible study time that we would like but we try to study as much as we can, can't we? What happens, though, when we just, you know, like Dari said, we need to stay in the Word. I mean, you know, how easy is it to keep your mind focused on God when you're reading the Bible, you know, the Bible daily? No matter what it is, even if it's just a chapter, you're still focused on that chapter, aren't you? And that chapter can stick with you throughout the day with whatever it might be. But then if you... Just say, well, I'm just going to skip today. You know, I have other things I have to get done. Uh, you know, I can skip one day. You skip one day, how easy is it to skip two days? It's almost, I mean, it's, it's, it really is a, it just kind of a snowball, doesn't it? Two days can turn into three days. And before you know it, you know, you come to worship on Sunday morning and you just say, well... Oh, yeah, you know, uh, now I'll open it. I'll open it because I have to, because, you know, the preacher said, oh, I'll turn to this first. <laughs> but when you skip it, I mean, that it's easier to, you know, it's easy to start getting that going, isn't it? And getting that pattern going. And the same thing with prayer. How many in here pray daily? We all, you know, we pray as much as we possibly can, don't we? And it doesn't have to be long prayers. And doesn't have to be, you know, a good routine to get into is praying, by the way, is just to set a time in a day where you just say, this is where we're going to pray. But it's a good, you know, it's a good habit to get into when you say, okay, this is the time of day. I'm going to wake up in the morning. First thing I do is pray. Or maybe I'll pray on the way to work or on the way to school, or I'll pray at my lunch hour. I'll pray. But it's, you know, but you know that, okay, this, this is the time that I know that I have to pray. And it gets easier and easier when you do it, don't you? Because when you really get in a prayer habit, it, you know, it keeps going. You know, write those prayer requests down. Pray for different people. Pray for, you know, and just get in the mindset of doing it. Because when you don't pray, just like not studying the Bible one day, it's easy. You just, you know, you go to bed and I'm just tired and I have, you know, I haven't prayed all day, but I'm just, I just, I just need to get to bed because I have to wake up early the next morning. And then all of a sudden you haven't prayed that whole day. Then the next day it starts all over again. And how easy it is it to just overlook it or become distracted of not praying again. And then you keep not praying. And pretty soon you find yourself not even thinking about prayer, not even thinking about opening that Bible. And you're just so and you're focused on this world and the things that you have to get done and the lists that have to be filled and just you know, all these different events that are happening. And all of a sudden, your faith that was once very strong or that you were really trying to build up to be strong starts to weaken, doesn't it? Because how can it be strong 
if I'm not working on that strong conviction for God, all of a sudden something else becomes that conviction. All of a sudden something else persuades me. Okay. 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 Hang on to that because I want to get into solutions in just a moment. But it's okay. Okay. Same thing, right? You miss one worship service. How easy is it to just miss two? It's when, I mean, and, you know, and it's, I mean, it's such a recurring theme with this, isn't it? Not studying the Bible, not praying, not attending worship, not attending Bible classes. And then, <coughs> excuse me, and then you just say, well, I don't, you know, I, I don't need to attend, you know, I don't need to attend that Sunday morning. It's not required. I don't see the Bible where, you know, I'd have to attend a Bible class or worship, but how edifying is it to, I mean, we're here on a Wednesday night. What is, the, you know, what's a, what's a perk on a Wednesday night? Of coming. Encouragement. It's encouragement, isn't it? I mean, how many during the week, whatever you do, with work, school, whatever your social life is, I don't know, but how many during the week get really bogged down and you just feel the weight of the whole week on you and you just feel like you're just dragging or you get in a mood? You know, that, that encouragement. You need that pick me up, that shot in the arm, don't you? What a great way to get it. Because are you going to get it at work? No, that's what makes you frustrated to begin, right? They're not going to do it. Or school. I mean, what better way to, you know, to, get a, to get encouraged than to be among like-minded people who, who believe the same thing and pray and you know, do everything? And so you know, not attending worship, not attending Bible class really can weaken your faith. It can make us discouraged. And the longer, you know, longer we go without attending, the less our faith even matters to us. And you get to a point where you just become just a stagnant Christian or you just become apathetic and just, you know, I don't care. And how is that going to strengthen our faith? And how is that going to keep that mindset on God like we can? All right, any others? Come on, there's got to be others. What can weaken our faith? Okay. Keep, I mean, keep your mind going, right? Okay. Can you expand on that? Like how... Okay. That's a really, I mean, that's probably a really powerful and very instrumental in weakening faith. Is that, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? Why do bad things happen to the innocent? You know, when you look at a child, why, you know, why is it their life that was taken? Why is it their life that was affected by this? You know, that drunk driver, you know, just walked away. Hey, now, by the way, we were uh, hit by a drunk driver um, right before we were married, and it almost took her life. And that was, you know, in my mind, I was so angry that I was thinking, why couldn't it have been them? They're the ones who did this. We're the victims. She's the victim. Why couldn't it have been you know, one of them who was in that hospital getting emergency plastic surgery? You know, and it just and it really does. It just because 
you know, how does that, how does get that getting that angry or, or like Greg was talking about when you see bad events happening, like these life changing or just these tragic events happening, how can that weaken our faith? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if he assumed 50 years of their life, all they can talk about is that accident. Okay. Why did that happen? You know, I think we've all seen people in our life that something bad like that happened, and it consumed 50 years of their life. Right. Or a couple of days they die, and they're still talking about that situation. And it's tough to let go, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's you know, and, and I'm talking about Christians. Because it's really easy for someone outside of Christ to look at that and say, how can there be a God who allows things like this to happen? But then you've got, it changes the game, though, when it's a Christian seeing that same event and seeing that same tragedy, and they're obviously affected by it, and they're, you know, and they're, they're, they're probably not going to say, okay, well, how is it, you know, it's, it, it's not going to shake them thinking that there's not a God, but it can certainly, you know, like, like Greg said, I mean, we hold on to it. And you just become so consumed and focused that you just lose sight of everything else that matters, or any other hope that you know that we might give. Is there, you know, is there is this prayer even really work? You know, I pray to God and I pray to God, and then I see stuff like this. Is you know, is prayer even impactful anymore? Or does God care about my prayer? Is He listening to my prayer? And it's just, I mean, it, you know, that's a, that's probably a big one is to see stuff like this. And, to, and, and especially when it's like happens to you or someone very close to you, or when you lose someone, does, I mean, how can it not affect us? And then it gets, you know, it gets to the point where we really do have that faith weakened, you know, the faith that's waned. Anything else? Shane, do you want? Okay. Okay, that's, I mean, that's, you know, when you play with, when you're dealing with emotions like that, it's, it's a tough thing to really get to that place where you feel, uh, you know, where you can, someone who has been away, and, you know, uh, because someone who comes back from being away, uh, you know, what, what are some of the issues that they can face, the, you know, with that, that goes along with that shame, well, I feel judged, you know, they're, they're looking at me, I know what they must be thinking about me. Even if they're just assumptions and the wrong assumptions, you in your mind are thinking, well, this is what they must be thinking about me because I know I haven't been here. And they're asking, hey, you know, we missed you. What's going on? And, you know, and they could be completely just trying to, you know, they care about you and just want the, the very best and thinking nothing. But that shame is, you know, can carry weight, can it? That, you know, that's the number one reason why people don't answer the invitation that is the biggest reason why someone does not, you know, we, we offer the invitation every Sunday. Now, it's not a, you know, we don't make people do it. It's not a time where, you, you know, we try to guilt people into doing it. That's not why it's there. I mean, when the invitation is offered, it's simply a way if someone has heard something or they've had something happen or they feel compelled that they need to come down and ask for repentance. If they haven't been baptized and they need to be baptized, it's a really convenient time to ask for something as simple as prayer. I mean, that's the biggest thing, is just to ask for the prayers of the congregation. But someone who has done something, or they feel like they've done something, that's the hardest walk to make, is from that pew to the front. Because you know what they're thinking? Well, I go down there, and they must, you know, all, all these people must be wondering, well, what did they do that's so bad that they have to come down the aisle? And they have built, they built this, they build this up to the point where they just, they don't want to deal with it. So what happens? They sit there in their seat. You know how many people I've had come up to me after the lesson outside of here? I can't even count. 
and say, oh, man, I was going to, I was, I should have come forward. I, you know, I was going to come forward. I was thinking about it. I meant to do it or had the intentions of doing it. And I just, for whatever reason, I didn't do it. Well, why? Well, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I mean, that's, uh, you know, your church family's here to support and to, you know, they want the best. Now, they're going to hold you accountable. There's nothing, you know, we have to be held accountable. But the reason why we're held, we hold each other accountable is not because we're trying to judge each other. It's because we love each other. I want you to get to heaven the way that I hope you want me to get to heaven. And if you have to hold me accountable for something that I have done, you know, by all means, I mean, that, if, you know, if that's what it takes... And it's a, you know, and, and, but it, it's a tough thing, isn't it? When you're on the receiving end of that and you're thinking, well, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to, you know, how, how, how do I deal with this? And that shame is a tough thing to overcome. Some of it's pride, and it is pride sometimes. I, well, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be judged like that because, I'm, you know, my reputation's on the line or they're just going to think less of me if I do this. But you, that's it. Sometimes you just feel so bad that you can't share in those things that you're doing. That's you know that's what you hope. You know when when you just you know when you get to that point, and it's almost a breaking point, isn't it? Where you just think, I can't sit here anymore. Don't you wish everyone had that? That they, you know, because there are people that I guarantee every single Sunday are at that point. Someone is at that point. Someone is thinking, should I go? And then they don't. And, you know, it's really an interesting situation because we need, you know, I mean, we need the love of our church family. We need to know not to be judged, but we need to appreciate being held accountable. It's also, you need to have a sense of your feelings for doing that. Once you do it, it releases so much of that that you can hold in there, and it, it makes the way for God's peace to come. Absolutely, it does. What else can we can our say? Because while we're talking about worship service, and while we, you know, if we feel like, you know, I mean, shame, you know, makes you feel well, I'm not worthy to go down there, or I'm not worthy to, you know, to ask, or I'm not worthy. Oh, by all means, you're the you are the one that's worthy. God says you're worthy. The church says you're worthy. Well, they should. <coughs> you know, to us. What about this one? Can anger weaken our faith? Huh? Okay. You know, Christ said, you have ought against your brother. What ha- you know, Before you come into that worship service, what do you do? You make amends. You go and you take care of it. Then you come in here. You ever been angry at someone in the congregation? Ever been angry at someone? Exactly. <laughs> you won't hear a word of it, will you? That's a, you know, that's a really consuming thing. It's, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest distractions you can have. Two people in a congregation that don't get along need to work it out somehow, some way. Because what happens, just like Greg said, you'll never hear a lesson, no matter what is said. And it can be profound and, you know, would have been the right lesson for you, but you'll never know because you come in and you sit on this side and the person you're mad at sits on this side and... And you're like, oh, how, you know, why are you stepping on my toes, right? <laughs> then you think they're just singling you out, right? <laughs> I've told people before, I don't, uh, you know, I've had people say, well, you, you stepped on my toes. I said, I'm not going for your toes. I'm going for your heart. <laughs> That's what God's word does. God's word doesn't step on our toes. It goes for the heart. That's what changes us. 
But that anger, I mean, think you're angry at someone else so much that you just are going to allow it to affect your faith. You're going to allow it to affect your worship. And many times, you know, I mean, you know, for one thing, you know, two people can be mad at each other, then both of them are stewing and not paying attention. A lot of the time, it's just one person, isn't it? One person gets mad at the other person, and the other person doesn't even know that they're mad at them. They just said, you know, they might have said something or done something that upsets this person and doesn't realize that it was upsetting to them. And this person just sits and it just grows and it festers and it just, it, it builds and it builds and that pressure is just building and they just, you know, and they just have nothing good to say. And they just don't want to talk to them and they don't want to interact. And this person over here, meanwhile, has no clue of what they've done. And all of a sudden, it's not his faith that's being weakened. Whose is it? It's mine. I'm the one that's feeling that way. I'm the one that's guilty of allowing that anger to come in the way of it. Okay. So improper, I'm just going to call it improper priority. Or your priorities are all out of whack, right? Okay. So we've got just a few minutes, and we've come up with this list. And different things are probably, how many have been affected by one thing on this list? How many have been affected by two things on this list? How many have been affected by more than two things on this list? Boy, this hits all of us, doesn't it? All of us have been affected. You know, it might not be all of it, but you think there are multiple things here that have caused us or that have tested us to possibly weaken our faith. And for some of us, it might have caused us to weaken our faith. So with the few minutes that we have, I want to turn this around. Because this is going to lead us going forward to, to look at where we are, where our faith is, and how this faith is going to be able to drive us to make good decisions. But let's take this list right here. All of this can help us weaken our faith. So how can we turn that around? How can we develop our faith to prevent these things from happening? And call them out. Anything on this list? How do we turn it around and make sure that we don't let it allow us to weaken our faith? We've, we've probably come up with some, you know, some things, some solutions already tonight. So let's expand. Just open your heart to God and, and come out. Okay. In what way? For which one? Yeah. For all of them? Yeah. For all of them? Okay. So opening your mind to God or opening your heart to God to make him, you know, here's the, make the improper, the proper priorities and make God... Okay. So the priorities are going to be a big thing, isn't it? I mean, just to put God number one in our life. Is it easy to put him number one in all of these areas? And what I mean by that, and I get where Sabrina's going with it, and she's absolutely right. You know, when we, when we can put God at the very forefront, it's easier to let everything just kind of fall into place. If you're that minded and mindful of saying, I'm just going to do things the way that God wants me to do. I'm going to read my Bible because I can look in the Bible and say, well, if I go, you know, what, what I've been going through, let's see if someone else has went through it the same way. Do you realize anything that we've gone through today, doesn't matter what it is, someone has gone through it. God has not, you know, ours is not the only thing that has happened to weaken faith. 
But we think it is, don't we? We think it's like the most unique thing. And when we go to God, we think, boy, I have the, I, you know, I have the king sin on this one, right? I have the one thing that God hasn't, hasn't dealt with. And so what, you know, we think it's just, and we build it up to be so bad, and then, you know, when we embellish it, and it might be bad, but we think, well, God, can't, you know, how is God going to deal with this? He has never seen this before. This hasn't happened to anyone else. But in all the time that people have been on the earth, you really think God hasn't seen it? He has dealt with it. He's seen it all. Maybe not the way that we think, but he's dealt with these relationships, hasn't he? Has he dealt with people not heeding to his word? Oh, absolutely. Who did that a lot? Israel. Not praying when they knew they should have prayed. Worship. And studying, you know, having these life-changing events. Can we read about people in the Bible who have had these life-changing events, who have seen someone else die that they love? Passed away, isn't it? Yeah. That's the whole reason they're even together. Right. So we have these life-changing events. The shame, the not feeling worthy of God dealt with that. So you know, so you put God, you know, in the, in the at the top of that in real life first. God has dealt with it. Then you can start asking Him for all these different things. It's not always easy though, is it? Because you get relationships, and relationships aren't quite the same as just not praying on an individual basis, because all of a sudden there's two people involved, there's you and someone else, right? And you're going to see that person, you're going to talk to that person, you're going to, you might get upset at that person, and they can really rile up your emotions. They know how to push a button, they know how to get under your skin, they know all the things that are going to be upsetting. They know what you like. They know what they don't want you to, to like. And so that can, you know, that can be a really tough one when you're dealing with other ones. But, you know, and then, you know, and then you get worship. That's our, you know, that's our church family. And you go there. And then all of a sudden when you start, you know, feeling angry, you know, a lot of these start to, you can start playing off of each other, can't they? And so how do we deal with this? How do we make, you know, how do we turn that around? The only way we're going to be able to do that is really to start putting God first and trusting in him. That's our, I mean, that's where your faith, you know, you think of it. That's where your faith was built up to begin, wasn't it? What makes your faith strong? God. The whole reason there is faith. You have the conviction, this strong persuasion that I know God exists. And I know God has dealt with these. And I know God can get me through them. Is he going to get me over them? Maybe not, but he's going to get me through them. And that is where, we, you know, that's why it is imperative when we start looking at faith, at knowing where our, you know, where, where that conviction lies and where we're going to really put our, you know, put our trust. And that's in him. Okay. Next week we'll continue with this and uh, we're going to get into some more things that, are, uh, that can help us strengthen our faith and also some things that can challenge us of not strengthening our faith as, faith as well.